Hey everyone, I'm Natalie Bensavanga. And I'm Leanne Jamira, and this is Heating Up. That's right, this is the show that explores the intersection between the foods that we love to make and the conversations that we need to be having around social justice and climate change. So sit back and relax while we make comfort foods that are good for you and good for the planet. So I'm really excited today because Natalie is going to be showing us her grandma's favorite soup. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually really similar to a recipe that my dad makes. Um, so I'm excited to see the differences between my dad's and Natalie's. So, so I, I'm now coining this Carmela's favorite soup because I know she would have absolutely loved that we were filming this because she loved anything that happened on camera with me. So, you know, grandmas are the best. So I made her this soup when she wasn't feeling well one day and she looked at me and she said, this reminds me of what my grandmother from Italy used wow. to make. And you don't get like a better compliment than that, you know? Yeah. So I'm really excited to share this with you guys today. It's a kale and garbanzo bean soup, but you can use any bean that you like. Mm -hmm. And what I like to add to this soup is some riced cauliflower, diced cauliflower, if you don't want to be fancy with it. And mm -hmm. if you don't have cauliflower, you can also use sweet potatoes or regular potatoes, which are really good in this soup as well. Oh, wow, okay. The reason I like this soup is it's kind of like whatever's in your refrigerator you can put it in and as long as you use the right sort of you know seasonings it gives it that real rustic cozy and i feel like that's how feeling. all of our recipes have been i know and you know i was like thinking about it yeah and i was thinking about that too leandra i'm glad that you brought that up because i think a lot of our recipes use a lot of the same components so mm -hmm. it is accessible for everybody it's not like you have to run out every time you want to make something from heating mm -hmm. up you already will have a lot of these things handy so that's yeah. part of the fun of this and that's how we all cook during the week, right? We're not like exactly. running to the grocery store every night. So every night. let's get rolling here. So this is actually a really simple soup to put together. I know that I need to start chopping something, right? Okay, what do I need yeah. To do? So, so we got some kale already going, but we can always use more kale. So okay. go, go ahead and start chopping some dino kale. I've used dino kale before, and the reason mm -hmm. is, is yeah. because it holds up so well in a broth that you can keep this soup in your refrigerator for literally days and I've done it and, and it'll still taste delicious. I actually think this soup's even better like the second and third day. So what we're going to use today is I just used a can of garbanzo beans that I just drained. Leandra chopped some white onion. You can use sweet onion, yellow onion. You can even use shallots, whatever you like. Um, we obviously are going to be using some vegetable broth. You can always make your own or if like me, you can just get some out of a box because I'm lazy and it's the middle of the week. But sometimes you can also use water and vegetable bouillon too. That can be a lot more cost effective. And then the secret to this, I think, is the sherry vinegar. It gives it like this, I don't know, like a tanginess. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have sherry, I've also just used lemon juice, which we have here, which I will still add. And I've used white wine too. Poured myself a glass and then poured a little in the soup and it turned out great. I also will add, I love putting vinegar in everything. Okay, right? It gives I it like a little vinegar something. vinegar in everything. The other night my dad was like, why does the kitchen smell like vinegar? And I was like, I put it in. Because Leandra was here. Yeah, I was in here <laughs> making myself dinner, sorry. And I've also used apple cider vinegar. I love apple cider vinegar. I mean, and that worked really well too. And the rest is really simple. It's just some garlic, a little bit of red pepper flakes, some miso paste because it gives it that sort of like, almost like a chicken broth kind of vibe when you Miso's put in some miso. Miso's good in everything. Yeah, and then of course our secret power ingredient that we use in pretty much all of my cooking and this your cooking too. This mountain of yeah. nutritional yeast. I would actually use more if it was socially acceptable. But yes, we're going to use that and amount. And private, you can do whatever you feels do. right. I add more. And then just some salt and pepper. So literally we're just gonna finish chopping. We're gonna toss everything in the pot, let it cook down for about 15 minutes, and your soup's ready to go. Okay, you guys, so Natalie is done with the soup. It smells really good. I say that for everything that she makes, but it's because it's true. <laughs> Are you um, talking about me when I'm not here? I love it. I was saying only bad things, of course. <laughs> do you want to try this? I do. Okay. And is this nutritional yeast on top? It is. So I always like to sprinkle a little nutritional yeast because, you know, if you were doing this the Italian way, you'd probably put a little parm, a little parmesan. Oh, okay. So in place of Parmesan, I always use nutritional yeast, but you can also there buy vegan. There is vegan parm. Yeah, yeah, you definitely can buy it, but nutritional yeast is so... Okay, I'm going to bring this up to my face because I don't want to spill it. No. Well, that's why I brought over one at a time because they're hot. So let's okay. do this. I'm not ready. You, you're Italian. Mm. You have a mouth that can handle mm. hot mm. food. You have hands that can handle hot food. I do. You could take out a pan out of the oven and be fine. I do, and it's problematic. 
I can't wait for you to taste that. I'm so nervous. It's going to be too hot. It's not. Don't worry. I don't want to burn my house. I'm sorry, you guys. Okay. Do you like good. it? Really simple. Mm-hmm. Like, and you really get the flavors of all of the components. You get the cauliflower, you get the beans, you get the greens, but then that that broth, right? With the miso and the sherry. I feel like this is definitely something for like, if you're not feeling well. It is, it's so comforting. Cause this was the original reason I made it for it's Graham. It's really simple. It's like easy on the stomach. Mm -hmm. That's at least what I get from it. Mm -hmm. Not too salty. Sometimes right. I have soup and it's way too salty. I really like this actually. Thank you. And you know what, like I said, what I love about this is it'll just continue to meld in the fridge. Mm -hmm. And then the next day and the next day and the next day, it just tastes better mm -hmm. and better and better. So just a little ode to Carmela. Yes. Gotta really love good. it. I'm glad you like it. And I know my grandma loved this. So I have a good feeling that our special guest is going to love it too. So I can't wait to plate this up and get them to try a little comfort in a bowl. And I can't wait for the conversation we're about to have. That's going to be amazing. All right, we are so excited. I feel like I say excited a lot on the show, but I really am just There's so excited. There's a couple words that are, that's gonna yeah, be Yeah, it's like, overused, I'm sorry guys. Our viewers are gonna take a shot whatever. every time we say it. I'm excited, I don't yeah. care. Um, we are though to have with us eco-feminist artist, hello, that's amazing, mm -hmm. Ashley Cecil is here with us. Applause everybody, <laughs> applause. Thank you. We are so thrilled to have you here. I. I, I was learning about you earlier in the year through my friends at the Women and Girls Foundation, and you gave an interview with Heather Renee, and I was just blown away. And I know it's true, and like when Leandra and I got to chat with you before this interview, we were both in like, yeah, kind of, you know, wow, yeah. this is amazing. So we want everyone to feel that experience I'm that we felt. Yeah. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you sort of came to coin this phrase, eco-feminist yeah. artist? Oh, I can't take credit for the phrase. It's a fitting one. But it came about because um, I'm a painter, and for a very long time, I painted much more traditional media, so it was, mm. uh, or scenes. I was painting portraits, landscapes, uh, cityscapes, and I uh, did that for years. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I did a lot of equine work. Um, but then I moved to Europe, and I really fell in love with the arts and crafts movement and pattern, and that is really um, central in my work. But mm -hmm. it was when I moved to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. That's, of course. that's where all the magic happens, yeah. right? Yeah. The magic happens in Pittsburgh. So I moved to Pittsburgh in 2011. Mm -hmm. And then I got here and I fell in love. So I had been doing all of this like nature themed work, um, but it was purely on the aesthetics. And then it was the museums here, like the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, the National Aviary, um, and a lot of the science institutions, science labs, based through our universities that I started to connect the dots between these elements and, and characters and species of nature and um, getting it wrapped into the science. Mm. And that's where climate change really came in. So um, it just innocently started with basically uh, going to amazing places like the section of birds at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History mm -hmm. and asking if I could borrow specimens for these artworks and mm -hmm. then I would just befriend the staff there, the ornithologists, people who were studying climate even if it wasn't their primary work, like if you were in science now, that's mm -hmm. kind of all encompassing. Mm -hmm. And I'd ask really innocent questions like, how did that die? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the floodgates opened mm -hmm. and there was no going back. So I started to then blend like all this work I've been doing for decades, um, rendering things in oil paints, birds, and natural mm -hmm. landscapes. But then I started to tell a narrative about how climate was affecting it. Mm -hmm. And then I became a mother, and then I, I guess I kind of found myself and lost my mind. And <laughs> <laughs> that, sound, that sounds like motherhood to a T. Found myself it, and lost my mind it, at it once. It really, all, all in, in, in one quick period. So that's when the component about feminism really came in and how women, there are a lot of parallels between the oppression of women and the domination of nature, which is mm -hmm. a statement that I use in a lot of my exhibitions. And once you kind of, you know, the light switch goes on, you just see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. The way that we hmm. um, police fertility and the way that we treat ownership of land and the way we have treat, treated ownership of women, there's there's a lot of similarities. So yeah. that's now playing out in the work. And I've come to find 
from someone else who's much smarter than I am that ecofeminism is like the perfect description of it. So that's, yeah, that's what I call myself now. Well, you know, I can only imagine that art is one of the best ways to work through those initial emotions Mm. of learning about climate change. I mean, I turn to art a lot, even though I'm not having exhibitions of my paintings. Never say time. never. Say that's never. right, that's but, right. Um, whether it's photography or film or poetry or art, I see a lot of young people mm-hmm. turning to it to work through their feelings about climate. So I guess, what were those initial emotions that you were putting into your work or those initial feelings? Ooh. And how did you see them in your art? When um, you look back at, yeah. at your old pieces. What my old pieces, it's funny you mentioned this because just last night, I was in my studio and I had taken a bunch of watercolor studies I had done more than 10 years ago Wow. Okay. of landscapes when I was living in Europe and they just seemed so like naive to me. So I all, I turned all of them um, upside, perpendic- down. upside down or perpendicular to the original orientation and I literally took a blowtorch and blew holes in parts of them and oh, then started layering. That is so cool. <laughs> I started layering them over these patterns that I do that are about the emotion of this, uh-huh. which is like, I feel this overwhelming reverence for nature because mm-hmm. now I'm more tuned into it. And then I'm just wholly terrified and, and frightened and depressed by it. So one of my patterns is a, a feminine looking eye that's shedding a tear and the tear becomes um, a fuchsia flower at the bottom and there's a hummingbird coming up to like feed on it. Mm-hmm. And it just repeats and repeats and repeats. So I put the, the watercolor studies with the holes on them, like over top of that pattern so that you could see through this burnt hole. So speaking of these emotions, right? So you had talked a little bit about motherhood. You touched on it. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine that motherhood is a transformative experience. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you know, you find yourself and you lose your mind. So when you're talking about how your work has shifted, and obviously that sounds to me as though it was aligned as to when you became a mother, mm-hmm. What are some of your thoughts about the future of our environment as you see it through the eyes of your children and also as an eco-feminist artist? Mm. Well, yeah, that's a, <laughs> oh, another big one. Yeah. I'm just going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> that's no, what I, we do I, here. I, 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 <laughs> it's, it, it's tough. Mm. Um, I think one of the... How old are your kids? They're three and seven. Yeah, so there's a lot Mm -hmm. of, and also um, their ages are significant because when I was, um, I went to Manaus, Brazil in 2018 for an immersion project in the rainforest with scientists who were giving lectures to artists about climate change, but instead of it all being just academic, Mm -hmm. you were seeing it, the destruction. Mm. and the biodiversity loss and uh, at the time my youngest was an infant so he was like eight nine months when I was there and um, I mean (laughs) my head was just an absolute mess I was still postpartum Mm -hmm. and experiencing all of this loss and it, it was tough and I realized at that time like these lectures would say in the year such and such we can expect this awful thing to happen, and I kept benchmarking it against oh. my son because he was one. So it was right. like, okay, one plus what, 50 years, right? And like that'll be, you know, 50. He'll be 50 when we're expected to have these devastating um, repercussions of our actions. Yeah. So I cried a lot. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, it was it was tough. Um, but to answer your question, like that, it it enraged me. It mm-hmm. depresses me and. But what I think was useful from the show that I had in January of this year at Zinka Gallery, um, the exhibition was titled Violence in Eden. Mm. And the idea in that was like you flip this narrative of what we are fed in the West, which is Christianity, Judaism, these other um, Western cultures, that it's a patriarchy and there are all these religious texts where women are seen to be the original sin. It, everything is our fault. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, That's fair. <laughs> and I, the whole thing just made me angry. Like, here mm-hmm. I have birthed two human beings. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm taking care of them. And now, like, I feel the one that's responsible for not only giving them a future that's mm-hmm. sustainable, but every child. Like, if we can accomplish that for your, it, one person's individual family, then you've done it for all children. Well, and I yeah. think the problem, too, when you're looking at a patriarchal structure is that we don't see all children as our children. Right. Right? You look right. at that nuclear family and that nuclear model. So it's like, well, this is mine. 
this is my child. I don't care about those children. This is my sure. child. So the whole structure sets it up that we aren't connected to one another. Mm -hmm. But that's a that's another narrative that we're yeah. fed in this culture that I further infuriated me. And I think this is why we're seeing more and more women who, many of whom are mothers mm -hmm. or have a strong sense of that relationship with their mothers, maybe sisters in their community mm -hmm. that feel like it is on us to like right this ship because, and it's not to say we don't have wonderful male allies in this. I mean, my husband, for example, is arguably sometimes a stronger feminist than I am. Like, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that he's in it. And here I'm raising two white boys, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We can all be a part of that solution. But I feel like because it's so culturally embedded in us to belittle women and for men to historically, to this point, have created much of the mess we're in, that like this weight now falls on us as, as mothers and community members to fix this. And there's nothing like motherhood to like snap you out of that to realize like, mm -hmm. No one's going to do it for you. The way that our systems currently are, as you guys were mentioning, yeah. you know, it's not like we're like share. We're all like, okay, let's like plan out these cities in a really smart mm -hmm. way on the land that will be livable, right? And we'll share, share this resources, space, share right? resources, share right. water. What's going to happen is that if we continue the way that we are, or the world looks like the one we live in, the top corporations are going to bottle all of the drinkable water, sell it back to us at really expensive prices, so people who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Will not get drinking water. So, like so, so I know we're going on a we're, we're going on the rabbit hole here. Oh, so, but to, to just bring yeah. us back and no, no, yeah. It, yeah. believe me, it's worth well, exploring. But um, this but, is why art is so important. Well, and because somebody can drone on for an hour, or somebody can have a beautiful painting in a gallery, and you can oh. hear those words without this voice attached. No, to and I love her oh, voice. Exactly but but what, what I was going to say is, and to your point, Leandra, you're like in my mind. Really, what we need to recognize is that art is part of that revolution, right? Yes. So, yeah. so in order for us to see and understand and have it connect to our humanity, that is art, yeah. right? Yeah. So can you talk about your role as an artist as it plays out as we're dealing with climate right. change? Right. Um, well, I think when I, around... Um, 2019, I had wrapped up a series of really extensive uh, residencies at places like Tree Pittsburgh and mm -hmm. Phipps and Natural History Museum, where I was really trying to tell a story about the data that they had unearthed through their mm -hmm. research. Um, but it, it was serving somewhat more in like an illustrative capacity, like science communication. And then I just, I don't know, I, I had like a break and I was like, forget it. I'm done dancing around it. Um, I'm just going to paint what I feel, right. which is, a, it's a lot. It's a complex series of emotions. And I also came to realize like emotions are not singular. That was an epiphany mm -hmm. I had. Like you don't just, you, you don't have to just be sad and depressed about this. They can be multifaceted and I can experience deep depression and, and fear. And I can also like all of a sudden now be so much more joyful that like I'm here to see this right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can hold those things in parallel. And I don't think I had gotten that before. But when I finally kind of er er arrived at this point where I was done dancing around it, I was done thinking about like museum audiences and how they might respond and you can't dig too far to turn people away. And I was like, forget it. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to paint exactly how I feel. Mm. And Woman after our own I'm hearts. You, I'm glad that you said that because <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you know, do you ever like go to the canvas and think to yourself, like, are you thinking of the audience? Or are you thinking just of I yourself? I have been, but now I, the, 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 the exhibition Violence in Eden was just me thinking. Mm. I mean, I wasn't considering anyone. It was just, it was just a total and emotional left, purge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but the thing is, um, while I was making that body work, probably over the course of a year and a half, um, I did worry, well, I didn't worry, but I would think like, why do this? Like, what's yeah. the point? Am I just trying to scare people? Like, what good is that? What a waste of my time. I'm just going to depress everyone. Yeah. But I stayed the course and we did the show. And of course, it's like absolute height of COVID cases when we had the opening reception. And again, mm. like, when am I dying? But it worked. And throughout the course of the opening, which because of COVID, we like staggered with very small groups with timed um, slots for them to come in to see the, see the work. Um, people cried and, and they said so many times like thank you for just like seeing me mm. like I this is how I feel every day and no one wants to talk about it 
I'm gaslighted. I heard that word a lot. I, I didn't prompt them to, or I didn't explain to them the piece to me. I oftentimes just like let them talk and um, they just like every time absolutely nailed it on the head, like how I felt in my heart. Mm -hmm. Um, so to me, that was, like you said it earlier, um, sometimes you don't have words for the things, but this is how art can be powerful, is because this is, like, my head and heart are not ready to, like, have my mouth participate mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in this, and yeah. I just needed to come out in an emotional way through art, and um, it, it is a... Um, Strong potion. Well, yeah, I mean, there needs to be like a decompression room almost to like come With back puppies. down from this. Something. Yes, we need some mm -hmm. therapy dogs. Yeah. Yeah. That's true, because it's intense. So often when you're talking about climate or any of these issues, you're told from climate deniers or whoever, mm -hmm. like you're being alarmist. Mm -hmm. You're scaring people for no reason. Right. Like, really, it's almost like I think we have, maybe you feel this responsibility as you mentioned earlier with being a mother, but there's a responsibility in letting people know this is what we're up against. Like this is really what right. is happening. Right. So well, was, women have been called alarmist and fanatical and emotional and crazy for Since I mean, the beginning of time. I mean for it's the women's that. movement, the right to vote, all of it, that you're hysterical. I mean, the God, the Victorian era was just awful for like what People would do to women because of the mm -hmm. accusations. Yeah. So nothing's different. Here we are yeah. again. So yeah. we, we always say no. This wow. is. I didn't think about that. <laughs> yep. And as we sort of wrap this up, because obviously we could t we could just go on and on about all of these important topics. I think. But as we sort of wrap this up, how can people connect with you and your work? Is there a website they can visit? Is there yeah. somewhere that you're going to be showing in the next several months? Do you have any? What's your next exhibition going to be based on? I guess give yeah. us a te give us a yeah. teaser. <laughs> well, um, I am in Pittsburgh, and I try to be out and about and connecting with folks, making community. Um, I have a website, it's ashleycecil.com, very straightforward. <laughs> so you can see the work, and um, I should be the eco-feminist artist. <laughs> I bet someone already owns that year-old, but if they don't, I should go do that as soon, make a note to myself, right as soon as I get home. Um, and I do Copy have... Right it, yeah. <laughs> it might be, too. We should look at We should Google this afterwards, see if it's available. Um, but I, I will likely have a show in 2022. Mm -hmm. Things aren't really ironed out exactly mm -hmm. yet. Um, but in, in terms of like connecting, I'm trying to, on social media platforms and other ways, um, share with people things I have found that help me keep my, my feet on the ground because there have been some really dark periods through this exploration where I thought like I, I don't know how to keep my head above water. Mm -hmm. And there have been some wonderful books, some great um, podcasts that mm -hmm. help like address like to remind me like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a special snowflake and like life has always been difficult and people mm -hmm. have found a way mm -hmm. to find like joy through hard times mm -hmm. and um and one book I recommend I just finish it is the all we can save hmm. it's I a good read book. it's a series of essays of course you do it's, <laughs> I'll read it though you'll have to let me borrow it yeah it's okay. amazing done <laughs> it's a collection of essays from all female authors mm. who are addressing the cli climate crisis in a raw, truthful, like, yeah, not, not, not dancing around it. But mm -hmm. they also remind us, like, of the broader context and mm. of how people have risen to the occasion in the past and also, like, how to find your joy in mm. these moments. And that is exactly what I needed because I don't want to stick my head in the sand. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not going to pretend it's not there. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about it at the Thanksgiving table. Um, but I also can't lose my mind. Right. Um, although well, I may have said I had, had already lost my mind. <laughs> no, but, I mean, I think that's what this show is for. So you don't have to have these conversations at the Thanksgiving table. So we're going to have them for you. And then you can just yes. share these episodes. So you thank you so much, Ashley, for joining thank us. You. And now, you know, you can really dig in. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I can't wait. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you.